The Forbidden Forest is one of the most mysterious and dangerous places in the Harry Potter world, where the darkest secrets of the Wizarding World are hidden amongst the trees. From life-altering encounters to pivotal plot twists, this forest frames Harry's journey, all the way from his first terrifying meeting with Voldemort to his final stand in Deathly Hollows. But want to know something crazy? The Forbidden Forest in the first Harry Potter movie is nothing like the experience we get in the book. For starters, in the book, Ron wasn't even involved in this detention the students spend with Hagrid hunting a unicorn killer. Plus, major characters who shaped Harry's fate? Completely missing. Some of the most intense heart-pounding moments? Gone. So as I was reading the book and watching the movie, it raised a question. Which version is better? Is the film adaptation justified, or did it strip away too much of the magic? Let's break it down, and by the end, you can decide which version truly captures the essence of this iconic moment in Harry's life. My name is Gibby, and welcome back to episode 14 of Movies vs. Manuscripts, Harry Potter Edition. This is a show where I analyze the Harry Potter movies scene by scene and compare them to J.K. Rowling's original books to find every single difference. As you might have figured out, today we are covering the trio getting caught after Draco sees him in Hagrid's hut, as well as their detention with Draco in the Forbidden Forest. This scene contains so many spooky and exciting moments, but the book really shines as we miss out on so many key elements in the movie version. Before we move on though, I wanted to give a shout out to this commenter from a previous episode. Every week, I'll be selecting one of my favorite comments from a past video to feature, so be sure to share your thoughts down below when you're done watching. Also, I think only like 5% of you are subscribed, so if you've been coming back each week to check out this series, hit that subscribe button. We're almost through the first movie, and I'm so excited to continue with the rest of the series. Per usual, I'll be covering all the differences across the four major categories of characters, timeline, location, and plot. But first, let's refresh our memory on what happens in this scene of the movie. Picking up from where we left off last week, we see our golden trio walking through the halls of Hogwarts and getting caught by McGonagall. We then cut to inside her classroom as she reprimands her Gryffindor first years, and then also tags on Draco, who is also out of bed after curfew. After learning that they're each losing 50 points, they get stuck in detention with Draco, and the movie cuts to Filch taking them to Hagrid's hut at nighttime for their punishment. Hagrid is crying as he says Dumbledore sent Norbert to Romania, and then they head into the woods. Hagrid tells them that they're looking for whatever hurt a unicorn, as he has found some unicorn blood around. They split into two groups, and as Harry and Draco go with Fang the dog, they come upon the dead unicorn. Draco runs off after seeing a cloaked figure over the dead unicorn drinking its blood, leaving Harry by himself. Harry has a sudden pain in his scar as the cloaked figure gets up and comes closer to him, but before it can attack, a large creature jumps into frame and scares this evil being away. Harry then meets this creature who saved his life, and learns that his name is Ferenz, and he is a centaur. Ferenz tells him more about who the cloaked figure might be, and why it's drinking the unicorn blood, and Harry finally realizes that Voldemort is still out there, and is trying to get the Sorcerer's Stone. After Hagrid and the others regroup with Harry, Ferenz leaves them, and we cut to the trio in the Gryffindor common room talking in front of the fire. Harry explains to Ron and Hermione what they missed out on, and tells them what the centaur told him about Voldemort using unicorn blood to keep himself from dying, and how Snape is after the stone not for himself, but for Voldemort. And that is where we'll cut off for this week. There's plenty of changes to cover, so let's dive right into our first three categories of characters, timeline, and location. To start, our character section is quite unique this week, as the book introduces us to two key characters who come back time and time again throughout the entire series. These characters are actually two other centaurs named Ronan and Bane. We'll talk about their involvement more in the plot changes. As for timeline, there's one small difference. Per usual, the events of these scenes really take place over the course of multiple days, even though the movie makes it seem like they happen the same night. I know the movie probably intended these to be separate nights, as we hear from Hagrid that Norbert was taken, which means that some time had to have passed in the movie version. However, in the book version, we get some context for the time in between these events that we don't get in the movie. Lastly, for location, we've got nothing. I mean, besides the usual spots in the castle itself, there are no notable major changes in terms of location. We still have the castle, the dark forest, and Hagrid's hut as our main places for these scenes and this chapter. So now that we've gone through our three smaller categories, let's jump into our plot changes. If you're new here, this is where 99% of our differences come into play. 
And after you've watched this through, I'll be curious to hear from you what you think about the book versus the movie, and which version you prefer. First, I should mention that I can't dive into every line of dialogue, so per usual, if you're looking to experience The Wizarding World in more detail, claim your free trial of Audible using my link in the description. This comes with a free audiobook, and you can follow along with me each week as I do this series. Alright, let's jump into the changes. To start things off, I typically give an account of everything that has happened in the time between the events of the chapters. However, last week we left things off on a cliffhanger as Harry and Hermione had been caught by Filch after they smuggled Norbert out of the castle. If you missed that episode last week, be sure to go check that out to get filled in on everything you missed. But here's a couple of key details. They smuggled Norbert out of the castle successfully, so Filch doesn't know they had a dragon. However, they did leave the invisibility cloak on top of the tower where they took Norbert, and so now Harry has lost his cloak and is in trouble for just being out of bed past curfew. I gotta say, in the movie, we start these scenes with the trio just walking carefree through the castle after curfew, even though they know that Draco just saw them at Hagrid's. Why aren't they sneaking around? I guess it wouldn't be convenient for the plot, but the way this happens in the chapter is a lot more realistic. Anyway, let's pick up from this moment right after Harry and Hermione get caught and see what all the differences are between these scenes and the book. First, it's important to note that Draco gets caught by McGonagall as he is trying to spy on and catch Harry smuggling a dragon. As we discussed last week, Harry and Hermione see him getting dragged off by McGonagall as they are under the cloak. The movie shows the trio all getting caught by McGonagall and Draco is by her side with a smug look, but in the book, Harry and Hermione are caught by Filch and brought to McGonagall after. Next, a massive change for the movie is the inclusion of Ron in these scenes. Want to know something crazy? Our boy Neville got snubbed once again as he is actually the third character involved in these scenes. Remember, Ron is still laid up in the hospital wing with an infected dragon bite on his hand, so Harry and Hermione are the only ones who get caught by Filch and taken to McGonagall. Now that plays into our next change, as I mentioned that Neville is the third person involved in this escapade, as he went out of bed to warn Harry and Hermione that Draco was going to tattle on them. The movie completely omits this version of events, but here's a brief summary. After Harry and Hermione get taken to McGonagall's office, they see the professor walk in with Neville. McGonagall then says that she figured out what happened tonight, and she tells them that they fed Draco some made-up story about a dragon with the intent to get him in trouble. She then tells them that Draco has already been caught out of bed. She then goes on to state that Neville must have also believed this made-up story, and Harry tried to give Neville a look to tell him that this isn't true. However, Neville's feelings have already been hurt as he now thinks that he was the victim of a mean prank from his own Gryffindor classmates. After this scolding, McGonagall took 50 points each, just like in the movie, of course with the difference being that Neville lost 50 points instead of Ron. Then she sent them to bed as their detention would take place at a later date. Now on that note, as I mentioned in the timeline changes, the movie immediately skips to their detention. However, in the book, we get a couple of pages of in-between context. So here's a brief rundown of the things we miss in this between time, which contains quite a crucial plot point. First, Harry heard Neville sobbing all night and felt horrible for him, but he was also dreading the Don himself as he wasn't sure how the Gryffindors would react when they found out 150 points had been lost, losing them the lead in the House Cup. The next day, it took a little while for people to notice the difference in the hourglasses which showcased the house standings. As 150 points had been lost, there was quite a significant drop in the Gryffindor's hourglass, and people thought that it was a mistake. But then, the story started to get out, and people realized that Harry had lost all the points. Of course, Neville and Hermione had two, but they weren't famous like Harry, so no one picked on them as much. Harry, however, got the worst of it, as even the Quidditch team stopped calling him by his name during practice, and Harry even tried to resign, but Wood wouldn't let him. Second, we have a much more impactful piece of context, which I wish the movie would have included somehow as it pertains to Quirrell and Voldemort. As we progress through the story, J.K. Rowling is dropping more and more hints about Quirrell's true nature, and this is one of the most impactful. You see, Harry told himself not to interfere with anything that didn't have to do with him, as chasing Snape around the school would lose them more points and it wasn't worth it. Especially because at this point, they still think Snape just wants the stone for himself, so who cares? But as Harry is walking back from the library one afternoon, he heard Quirrell's voice inside a classroom, sobbing as though he were being threatened. He heard Quirrell eventually say, All right, all right as he let out a sob and then left the classroom, adjusting his turban as he went. Harry then peered into the classroom and saw a door ajar on the other side, but didn't go in after it as he remembered his promise to himself to not meddle in this again. But he notes that he would gamble all his galleons that Snape had just left the classroom after threatening Quirrell. Harry then rushed back to the Gryffindor common room and told Hermione and Ron what he'd heard. 
Ron quickly guessed that Snape has done it and convinced Quirrell to help him, and Harry could see the spark of adventure in his eyes again. This probably is because he didn't get in trouble last time, but Hermione quickly told Harry to go to Dumbledore like they should have done ages ago. However, Harry says that they've got no proof, and therefore it's no use to go to Dumbledore, as he'll think that they just made it up to get Snape fired. He then says that they need to just let it be, even though Ron is keen on another adventure. And at that, they go back to studying, as Harry is determined to not lose Gryffindor any more points. Now before I move on to the next change, I do want to point this out. As you have already probably noticed, this moment with Quirrell is crucial to building out and foreshadowing the finale of this story. Quirrell was not with Snape in the classroom, but rather speaking to Voldemort, who is torturing him and threatening him to get the job done despite Quirrell not wanting to continue. Small moments like these are removed from the movie, so when you get to the end of the Sorcerer's Stone film, you have this true shock as Quirrell is revealed to be the bad guy. The book, however, builds out his character way more, and hints to the turban a handful of times so that when you have the final reveal you are surprised, but you also go, Oh, that makes so much sense now. Sadly, we don't get that from the movie. Now let's move on to the next key moment in this chapter, which is the primary focus of these scenes in the movie, and that is their detention in the Forbidden Forest. One morning at breakfast, Harry, Hermione, and Neville all receive notes from McGonagall stating that they would have detention that night at 11 o'clock. So that night, they met Filch, who led them to Hagrid's hut for their detention, alongside Malfoy, who just like in the movie, was quite afraid of the forest. The main difference to start us off for this scene is Hagrid's demeanor and explanation of where Norbert is. You see, because Norbert the dragon was safely smuggled out of the castle and taken to Charlie in Romania, Hagrid was not as depressed at this point in the book. Although I am sure that he would have liked to keep the dragon, the movie portrays him as being sad and nearly shedding a tear as the kids come up for their detention, saying that Dumbledore had the dragon sent to Charlie in Romania. Of course, this is aligned with where the book sent Norbert, but the means by which he was sent there are drastically different. Primarily, the fact that two 11-year-olds masterminded the smuggling of a dragon out of the castle without authorities knowing, whereas the movie gives the credit to Dumbledore and there's no smuggling. As for Hagrid's demeanor in the book, he is his usual jolly self as he asks Harry and Hermione how they are when they arrive and tells Filch off for being late. Next, there is a key difference between Draco and Hagrid's interaction in the book and movie. As in the movie, Draco gets away with abusing Hagrid quite a bit. Just like in the movie, Draco talks about how going into the forest is servant's work, and he name drops his father. However, unlike the movie, Hagrid tells Draco that he is either going in the forest or he can pack his bags and leave Hogwarts. He tells him that his father would tell him that's the way Hogwarts does things, and asks Draco if he thinks his father would rather have his son expelled. This shuts Draco up, and I gotta say I quite like Hagrid putting Malfoy in his place. Next, a smaller change is that Neville goes with Draco first, and Harry and Hermione accompany Hagrid. In the movie, of course Ron is there instead of Neville, but more importantly, Harry gets paired with Draco to start. Now, eventually, Harry does get paired up with Draco, but it doesn't happen until a bit later. Before we get to why Neville and Harry switched as partners with Draco, we need to cover a key moment that happens while Harry and Hermione are with Hagrid. In the movie, they run into two centaurs. We'll cover Harry's encounter with Ferenz, the centaur in the movie, later, but for now, the movie completely omits this first meeting with two centaurs named Ronan and Bane. These are key characters that will come up multiple times throughout the entire book series. What happens during this moment in the book is that Hagrid hears something and loads his crossbow with an arrow, yelling into the forest that he's armed. Suddenly, a half-man, half-horse appears, and Hagrid recognizes it as Ronan. Hagrid tries asking the centaur if he's seen anything strange, but in typical centaur fashion, Ronan doesn't give him a straight answer and simply says that Mars is bright tonight. Soon after, another centaur named Bane shows up and Hagrid asks him the same question, but receives the same answer. Hagrid then tells them to let him know if they see anything, and he walks off with Harry and Hermione. As they're walking off, Hagrid tells them that many centaurs live in the forest, and that they have deep minds but speak in riddles, and it's near impossible to get a straight answer out of them. And now we come to our Neville and Draco moment, which of course, the movie omits. Soon after leaving the centaurs, red sparks shot into the air, and Hagrid rushed out to find Neville and Draco, as they might be in danger. As you might have guessed though, they weren't in danger at all, but rather Draco snuck up behind Neville and grabbed him, causing him to freak out and shoot red sparks into the air. Hagrid came back with the two boys and was fuming, telling them that it would be near impossible to catch anything now. Then he swapped Neville and Harry, and they split back up again. Next, we have a change that some might consider small, but really has a massive effect later on, and builds out the key characters, which are the centaurs. You see, much of the scene with Draco and Harry is the same as the book. 
They find the unicorn, Harry's scar hurts as he sees a figure drinking the blood, then a centaur named Ferenz saves the day. The primary difference, however, is the fact that after Ferenz saves Harry, he has Harry ride on his back all the way back to Hagrid. As they're running through the forest, Ronan and Bane join Ferenz, and Bane reprimands him for letting a human ride on his back. He says that he's not a common mule, and asks if he has no shame. We immediately get context that the centaurs are incredibly proud creatures who are greatly offended by this act, even though Ferenz is acting out of goodwill and saving Harry's life. Also, we learn that the centaurs care a lot about the alignment of the planets, the fate and destiny of the world, and they do not want to interfere with events. So the fact that Ferenz interfered and saved Harry's life also goes against their code. But Ferenz fires back at Bane, saying that he has set himself against whatever is killing those unicorns, and if a human helps, then so be it. They then run off and we get a similar conversation to what the movie shows, with Ferenz explaining to Harry what unicorn blood can be used for, and telling Harry that Voldemort is after the Sorcerer's Stone. Finally, Harry sees the bigger picture, and realizes that Snape isn't after the stone for himself, but for Voldemort or so he thinks. Finally, we have two more changes for these scenes. First, it's a smaller one, but I wanted to make note of it, and that is that Ron tells Harry multiple times to not say Voldemort's name while Harry explains what he learned that night. Twice, Ron gets almost angry at Harry for saying the name out loud, and this is our first subtle taste of the difference between Hermione and Harry and Ron. You see, Hermione and Harry were raised by muggle families, but Ron was raised by wizards and experienced growing up with parents who had lived through the dark times of Voldemort's terror. In the Weasley house, Ron probably got scolded and punished for saying the name, and told of stories about witches and wizards dying because they said Voldemort's name. So it makes total sense that he is terrified of Harry using it so liberally. Lastly, the final change is that Harry's cloak was returned to him that night. The movie doesn't have a point at which Harry loses the invisibility cloak, but in the book, he lost the cloak on top of the astronomy tower after dropping Norbert off. He probably thought that he would never get it back, but at the end of this chapter when he climbed into bed, it was folded up under his sheets with a note that simply said, just in case. Now I don't know about you, but that's a lot of changes. My key takeaways are that they really screwed Neville. Again. Plus, the centaurs really play a decent sized role later on, and the exclusion of Ronan and Bane just shows the viewer that they really don't plan on utilizing these creatures in the future movies. The relationship between Ronan, Bane, and Ferenz is a complicated narrative that has roots much deeper than this scene, but sadly, we won't get to see the fruit of that later on. But enough of me, what do you think about these scenes and the changes made? Do you think each medium did a good job telling the story, or do you wish the movie would have stuck closer to the book's version? Let me know in the comments below. As always, like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and check out all the episodes you've missed so far by checking out the series playlist below. Have a great week, and I'll see you in the next episode.